Hello, hello, and welcome to another exciting episode of Skeptics and Seeker Sunday Sermon. This is David and Mac. Let's get started. How are you doing, Mac? I'm doing good. How are you? Uh, shitty. Uh, so this is the mid-season finale. Uh, so we're going to close out this series uh, very strong, even though I'm not feeling very strong. We're going to close strong, <laughs> and uh, we're going to take a break from the regular show for probably a couple of months. If you would like, you can think of it as my uh, annual mental health break. I usually take a couple of these, and I usually take my break earlier in the summer. But things have been uh, weird, so it's going to be later in the summer. My plan is to come back in full force probably around mid, excuse me, uh, October, mid to late October, depending on how the recovery from surgery is going. Um, for anyone under a rock who does not know, uh, the knee surgery that I have been teasing for a year, <laughs> it's been delayed for this thing and that, is finally on it, September 18th. It's a big one. It's not just your typical knee replacement. Knee replacements are big surgeries, really, but this one is a knee replacement plus some other stuff uh, uh, to correct some uh, issues, and the recovery is going to be very hairy. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm I want to take some time to prepare for that, prepare the house, prepare my mind, scared to death. I know exactly what's involved. I've had major surgeries and I'm still scared to death. It's like flying. Uh, I'm scared to death every time I fly, but I still do it. And I'm scared to death every time I have a surgery. Uh, I still do it because you have to. And this one, it, if there's any surgery worthy of fear, this is, this is one of them. So that said, it's coming and I'm going to take a little bit of time to to do that but there'll still be shorts uh if uh, i am successful after this show mac will know how to do shows and be able to put some stuff up and so i look forward to some interesting content uh this during this break that i don't do so that's gonna be fun um about Blocking in the board. I didn't uh, really plan to make this comment, but I just want to. I just want to say it. Uh, I am in full favor of blocking. Anybody can block me. Matt can block me. Fine. No harm. No foul. Uh, I believe in the importance of mental health, and you can frame it any way you want to. Mental health is the way I frame it. Uh, you know, uh, getting getting rid of toxic toxicity, negativity, whatever it is. Uh, that you know, eating up time in your life. However you want to put it. Uh, great. That's good for your productivity. That's good for your mental health. Do it. But I also suggest this. Do it for a season uh, and then unblock. I used to do that uh, some. Um, come dip in and out. Um, give 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 people a chance to prove that they're still assholes or that they're not. <laughs> um, take a moment to get out of your comfort zone. Uh, listen to people that you don't want to listen to. Um, and, and then uh, when you've had your feel... It, Block them again. <laughs> so, right, right, it's a, right. It's it's that sort of thing, you know. Um, you you come in, you come out. But what what I don't ever want to do, you know, even with someone like Donald Trump, whom I hate, um, I don't want to ever write off humans, uh, bad humans. Uh, Putin, who I really think should get the fifty cent solution. Um, you don't want to write off people uh, as hopeless. You know, when you fight a war, the goal of a war shouldn't be to wipe out your enemy. It should be to stop whatever bad thing that you think is bad enough to go to war in the first place and rehabilitate those people into society again. That's That should be the goal. And if your goal is anything else, fuck you. Um, uh -huh. So, yeah. So, it uh, at the point that we get to where we start picking and choosing people to throw away as if they're just garbage, uh, then I think we've crossed a, a, a line. And you can. I mean, there's. I'm not saying you can, and I'm not saying that I never have. But I try to, you know, when I realize I've crossed that line, come back from that line. Um, and, th you know, this happens on discussion boards too. You, you get uh, an idea of a person and you, you just... You know, that person's garbage. I don't want to deal with him. But you know what? That person, for whatever reason in the universe, is in your your sphere of influence. And you are in theirs. And we only are given so many people within our sphere of influence. 
And I think that if we can learn to communicate with the people that we dislike the most, the world becomes better. Uh, and so I, I would just encourage, uh, you know, those of those of us, I almost said those of you, those of us who <laughs> who block for mental health, and sometimes we leave the board for mental health, even me, um, you know, do it for a season and come back. I think there's a biblical principle uh, of that. Am I right, Mac? Uh, you you don't throw away people when you withdraw from them. You withdraw from them for a time in the hopes that you can win them back. Right, right. So everyone that I have blocked, I don't think that they're less human. Or I, I don't think, like, I don't even have any ill will towards any of them. It's just, uh, it just became necessary. And I like what you just said, you know, just do it for a season. Like, those guys, at some point... <laughs> will be off the block list. So I have actually unblocked, then unblocked, then blocked again someone. Uh, so I'm, that's definitely like the pattern you just laid out. That's pretty much my template. So I agree with everything you said. Uh, I don't I don't know about the pudding stuff <laughs> you said about the two cents. <laughs> the 50 cent solution. <laughs> the, oh, the 50 cent solution. Yeah. I don't know. I don't, I don't know how much, I don't know how much bullets are. Okay? I, don't, I, don't I, don't know, I don't know about that one. <laughs> <laughs> um, but everything else you said is like, yeah, sometimes, uh, you know, like remove yourself from a sphere of influence, but don't throw away the person. Uh, don't like, like it, do, it doesn't diminish the person. Um, it's not, it's not about like, okay, I'll, uh, you're not like even the worst person on the planet, they're still a human being and they have dignity and a certain dignity, a certain respect that you should afford them. And that's the way I feel about the people. Um, it's not like I, I don't hate them. I don't dislike them. I don't dislike them. It's just that it was getting too much and this is like a timeout. And yeah. and, and if and let's say like I, I unblock them, let's say two months from now, whatever, uh, or two weeks, and then they still go back to what, like, I'll just do it again. It's like, it's not a big deal. You know, right. like, even, it's, right. it's not even, it's just clicking a button. It's not, it's not yeah. even persecution. It's just clicking a button and that's it. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's, that's, that's all it is. And, um, you know, I think, um, I, I, you know, I, Mag and I have had a, a long, uh, relationship almost since the beginning of, um, SNS and it's been bad for the vast majority of it. So I don't uh, see it that way. I don't see it, it as bad. I do. Say, it's been, I, there it's, was a patch. I would say a, there's a stretch where it was bad, but I wouldn't say most of it has been bad. It's it's been rough. Uh, you know that's that's cool, but it doesn't matter because um, I uh, I I try to practice some of the things I preach, and I this is one of the things I really believe in uh, as an ethic. And um, it and I believe in it not just because it sounds kumbaya, but because it works. It's it's just proven true again and again and again that when you um, when you can view people as worthwhile, uh, even even if they're dangerous, even if they're mentally unstable, even if they're wrong about everything even if they're rude uh when when you can uh when you can view that humanity as something worth salvaging uh, you make the world a better place you certainly make your world a better place and i think if everyone did that the world would be a better place um and so it's just it's it's just one of those crazy ethics that I have. Well, it's uh, a Christian managed. ethic, so I mean, well, good. I, I I'm, I'm glad got, that Christ yeah. agrees with me. Um, I don't think you got that from <laughs> <laughs> somewhere else. I don't. I, I don't know. I think you're. You reading didn't get it that. from Islam. Um, <laughs> I think you're reading that back into Christianity. Honestly, <laughs> I have to. I have to. Yeah, but. But let's let's do that. So today's show, uh, I want to uh, accomplish two things, and I don't, and I want it to be short. So all of the all of the above. So most of the show probably will happen on the uh, board. I don't have a hard stop, but 
you know, Mac and I have some, some stuff to do after the show. And, um, uh, and then I also have a life. So, uh, I want to, I want to get through this, but I don't want to cut it off prematurely, but also recognize, uh, there's the board. Well, we, we, we have the board and I will be spending more and more time on the board as I spend more and more time, uh, at home. So, uh, I want to do two things. Uh, thing number one, I want to give you my idea of Orthodox Christianity. So regardless of whatever else any one thinks, no matter what, you know, the polls say, uh, about what Christianity is, no matter what I believed when I was a Christian once before, I want you try to be as fair as I can and read Christianity. What I, what I, what feels like correct Christianity to me. I, I want to avoid true Christianity because I think that Christianity can still be Christianity, even if it's incorrect in a, in a lot of places. And so uh, maybe we can get down to some of the places where I think it's, it's non-negotiable. So I, I want to do that and I didn't write anything out. And so, you know, I've thought about this a little bit and I'll try not to ramble too much, but that might take a minute. Uh, I don't plan to debate these things so much. So I know that Mac is going to uh, want to push back on lots of these things, but I'm going to, I'm going to do this first as just kind of a, a monologue and then Mac can push back on whatever he wants to. And I will, I will probably just leave it at that because I'm not trying to so much convince anyone that I'm right. I'm just, I'm just sharing you what my views are, uh, which, which could very much be wrong. Uh, but you, you can at least, you know, understand some of my biases when I talk about Christianity. And the other thing that I want to do will be more of a, a Mac section of the show where I want to maybe question Mac and, and, and get Mac to talk about a thing that I think has played Christianity forever, but even more in the internet, internet age, which is, you know, the Christian epistemology, which is knowing the truth about Christianity, which is what I mean. So Christian epistemology from an outsider's perspective. I don't care about the insider perspective. You know, you're a Christian or you're a well, well-practiced counter theologian. Forget that. The outsider, someone who is not a Christian, who is watching and listening to Christians, how are they supposed to know which is the right Christianity? So it's one thing to say what the right Christianity is or know it for a fact. It's another thing then to direct for someone who doesn't know that how, to, to figure out how they're supposed to know it. Uh, so that's, that's a part of this. So I want to, I want to go ahead and get started. My, my throat is already a little sore. And so I want to, I want to get the long monologuing out of the way. <laughs> um, so what is, what is, Orthodox Christianity to me. I I have to first start this with what feels like a a, a punt, punting on first down. Uh, American football folks uh, love it and live it. Uh, punting on first down is a thing that no one ever does in football because it's stupid. Um. That said, there are teams that would have won games if they had just chosen to punt on first down instead of run a bad play and turn the ball over. But that's <laughs> this is not sports talk. Um, it's it's not a cop out, but it'll feel like that to you for a minute. I don't believe there is a such thing as Orthodox Christianity. Now, I have actually written about this. Uh, I am pretty sure that I've done at least one show about this. So when we talk about Orthodox Christianity, uh, we've got a couple of definitions of Orthodox that are floating around in the ether. I think the most common definition of Orthodox is that which is most uh, that that which is commonly accepted, uh, you know, as the official view of something, you know, the the popular slash official Christianity. But there is no official to officiate <laughs> in Christianity. Catholicism is a little bit different. Catholicism can defeat these vagaries of orthodoxy because uh, they have a pope. 
And so no matter what you think tradition says, the Pope can speak ex, ex cathedra. That is orthodoxy. <laughs> so um, that's that's where Catholics, I think, have a little bit of an advantage. You know, and and um, ca individual Catholics can choose to follow Catholic orthodoxy or not. They can choose uh, choose to believe it or not, but they can't deny its existence. I think Christianity, uh, outside of Catholicism, is way different. And it's, it's at a real disadvantage because there's no official to officiate. But that's actually not the definition of orthodoxy that I'm going to be using for most of this. The definition of orthodoxy that I mean when I use the word, whether it's a, a right way or a wrong way to use it, is original. When I, when I talk about orthodox Christianity, I usually mean original Christianity. And I think if you're going to talk about the official Christianity, you've got to talk about what, what Christianity was intended to be. Right? The, the original intent. Anything else is heterodox. I don't care how official that heterodoxy has become. So uh, just as an example, I don't think there's any part of the original intent of Christianity that would stop uh, people from using contraceptives. But Catholics say, no, you can't use contraceptives. That is orthodoxy for Catholics. But I would argue that's not orthodox the way I mean orthodox. It's heterodox. Um, so now that you know what I mean by orthodoxy, it might hit even harder when I say, I don't think there's a such thing as orthodoxy. There is no such thing as original Christianity. There's no such thing as the original intent of Christianity. If there was, it's lost to history and can never be found. Orthodoxy is impossible um, for Christianity. And so I, I think that when, when these debates come up about real Christianity, I laugh a little bit to myself because I, I think that you don't understand the history of Christianity. Uh, so just taking the New Testament uh, in, in two segments of the New Testament, one segment, the Gospels, and the other segment, the letters. I'm not, I'm not worried about any other parts of it at this, at this particular moment. Uh, the Gospels and the letters. Now you might think, if you want to go to the original intent of Christianity, you've got to go to the Gospels. You've got to see what Jesus said, because he's the one that Christianity is about. So you got to see what he says. However, the Gospels were later. <laughs> the letters were actually first. <laughs> and so, um, as everyone knows by now, I'm a reluctant mythicist. I don't think there was a Jesus uh, who was there first you know, creating the rules for Christianity. I think those things were kind of after the fact. We kind of created a Jesus narrative that, you know, that spoke to some of the tr uh, Christian traditions that already existed. No, the first thing that we have, at least from, uh, from a documentary perspective, is Paul. Th that's what we got first. Now, you might argue that Paul was referencing some things. I'm not arguing that there weren't religions before Paul, but I think that mostly uh, what Paul was doing was heavily syncretizing with Judaism. Almost everything that Paul had to say was a spin on Judaism, and it was a, a way that many Jews were being at the time. Uh, he was dealing with a problem of a dying religion. And uh, you've all heard me talk about this a lot, too, so I'm, I'm not going to stay on it very much. Judaism was a dying religion. Your temple is gone. Your, your independence is gone. Uh, you have been, you know, uh, uh, slave traded. You've, you've been overlorded. Uh, you've been wandering uh, for uh, decades, maybe centuries uh, at this point with the Babylonians, the Syrians, the Persians. Um, and now the Romans, right? So the Jews don't look like they're ever coming back. 
and uh, yeah, there were, there were those Jews who were still trying to come back uh, and establish an earthly kingdom. Uh, hello, Jewish war. Um, but I think that most, or at least a, a significant portion of Jews were working with a different narrative. And I think that that narrative started way back in the, um, the, um, period of the, the wandering. So, uh, it's how can we be Jewish without any of the Jewish stuff? Our priesthood is messed up. Our people, uh, our bloodlines are messed up. We got no temple. Uh, we got no Ark of the Covenant, <laughs> you know, whatever. Uh, all of the stuff that we're supposed to have that makes us Jewish, we don't have that anymore. Or if we do, it's under the rule of someone else, and so we don't control it. And so I think that uh, Paul is really creating, uh, and, and he's one of, one of many who are creating a kind of durable Judaism that can reinterpret Judaism. Uh, and live on without any of the old trappings of Judaism. And I think that that is the fundamental basis of Christianity. Um, so, again, we've got all of my off-season to, to talk about this for those who have not heard this. A lot of this is red letters, so you have heard it. Um, so I'm actually starting to wrap up. So what you what you get then in the New Testament is Paul, who I think comes first and starts articulating, uh, is one of the first to really clarify in a close to systematic way what New Judaism looks like, and this is what we call Christianity. And I think it's why we associate Christianity more with Paul than we do with Jesus. Um. And then, I think Jesus is humanized. Your brain's not working. The, you know what I mean. Um, uh, he is the euhemerization, euhemeratized. He's you mean the like one. A synthesis. Is that a so? Euhemerization is when you take a mythic figure and you. Uh, start making them more and more human and placing them in history. So it, 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 an, an example of humorization would be like uh, uh, like the Greek gods. Uh, you know, they're, they're these mythical creatures out there, but the more the story is told, the more human they become, uh, the more they have a real history that's associated with humans. Uh, but that comes after the myth, not before the myth, because they were myths. <laughs> and so you, you want to take it and make it, weave it into the actual human history. And so that's that's um, humorization. And I think that that's largely what happened in the case of Jesus. Now, that is not to say, even though I'm a mythicist, that's not to say that there wasn't a person that they began to weave this myth around. Uh, and, you know, they could say, well, this is a Jesus figure and it started at this time and it was, you know, in this place. But I, I, I think that you get the Jesus stories, you know, decades after Christianity had started. And so whatever Jesus taught about Christianity was just one group's view of Christianity. And you can't even say that that is a unified view because the four gospels that we have are just four of the many gospels that are written. We've got those four gospels and even they don't agree. So what is the original Jesus story? We don't have one. And so to make sense of the gospels, we kind of weave those stories together in our mind, uh, kind of like Bart Ehrman talks about, and we create a gospel that doesn't exist. It's the gospel of the mind that puts these things together. So there is no orthodox Jesus that, that we can see. There, there simply isn't one. There isn't even an orthodox Christianity of Paul and the other apostles. There just isn't, because they're from, from book to book, in situation to situation, there are differences, and Christianity seems to develop over time, uh, even through the New Testament. So I just, I think 
this is a you know to make a long story long i think that um the idea of getting down to the orthodox christianity the original nub it's pretty much impossible there's no place in the bible uh, certainly not in the new testament um where there is a systematic theology laid out okay this is this is christianity right we we've got to read the whole thing and piece it together get the whole counsel of god uh, these things weren't written all at the same time. So if you if that's what you're saying, then what you have to admit is no one ever had it or they had it in some oral tradition that we don't have. It, it doesn't exist in the New Testament. So now I'm going to try to give you what I have pieced together. Okay, so understand that my first real truth is it can't be done. But to not make it a total cop-out I'm just going to go through a handful of issues, and Mac, this is where you can have some interaction here if you want to ask me about specific issues uh, that that I don't mention here. But I would say that the first thing we start with are the salvific issues, and in particular, how does one get saved? So my current view, just with the biblical literature, isn't a ton different than my view when I was uh, a Christian and a, and a younger, almost fundamentalist Christian. <laughs> that might surprise you. So I actually believe that baptism is a requirement. Just reading the Bible, okay? I don't believe any of this now. I think it's all bullshit. But if you're if you're just reading the literature and trying to extract theology from it, I think the truest theology is that baptism is required. I'm not going to go into the whys of it, and maybe during this off season, if if there are a lot of questions about it, I might do some shorts on it here and there. But um, I don't think you can get away from it. And even if you can say, "Oh no, well, uh, we're saved by faith, not by works, and baptism is a work," uh, that doesn't phase me at all, because it, all I need to show is that Jesus said to do it. So, no, whether you understand it as a work or not is irrelevant. The real relevant thing is that you are refusing to do a thing that Jesus said to do. Um, so I don't think that you can be a Christian and reject what Jesus taught. <laughs> and I think he taught baptism. So um, uh, I'm, I'm going to plant my flag on baptism uh, being a requirement. I am also going to plant my flag, since I brought it up, on works. I don't think a person can be saved without works. Now, I think that we have to define works because it's kind of become a, a curse word almost in religious circles. You know, faith and works ha have become this false dichotomy. And uh, when I was a Christian, I, I believed that it was a false dichotomy then. I believe it's a false dichotomy today. Um, although that said, I don't necessarily believe that Paul and James taught the same thing. Uh, but I do believe that it's a, a false dichotomy. It doesn't have to be, uh, opposition. If you have faith, putting your trust in Jesus, and if that is an act of volition that you put your trust in Jesus, then that is also a work. You cannot have that kind of faith without volitionally trusting Jesus. And anything that you volitionally do is a work. <laughs> so you you can't get away from that. You can't say, well, I have faith without works. No, you don't. And James mocks that idea. Uh, faith without works is dead. Works are the evidence of the faith. You also can't say that you repent without faith. Repentance, yes, it starts in the heart, but it has to carry over in everything that you do with your life. And, and, and notice the words I used, everything you do, your works have to be transformed uh, as well as your opinion about things. Repentin uh, repentance isn't about having a different opinion. It's about being different. <laughs> And, um, and, and part of that would be accepting the mandates and doing the mandates, carrying out the mandates that you're given. Uh, 
those are works. And you can say, well, uh, but I'm not saved by those works. Great. You're not also not saved without them. You don't, you don't get to say, oh, I trust Jesus. Uh, so I'm saved, but I'm not going to do any of the bullshit he said. Because then I, then I think, if, I think that you have evidence that you don't trust Jesus. Uh, so I, I definitely believe that there are works and, uh, you know, Jesus talks about, you know, visiting the, uh, he, uh, visiting the, the sick, the imprisoned, the orphans, feeding the, uh, hungry, uh, doing good works. I think those are, uh, necessities, but, but I also think that those are evidences of your faith, but just because faith came first doesn't mean that those works aren't necessary. So um, I'm going to I'm gonna find myself on the side of probably Catholicism there. Um, I believe that. Other things about salvation, I believe. I believe you can lose it. Uh, you can lose your salvation. You can lose anything. There's, there is nothing about you that you can't lose. You can lose your life. It's easy. And I think that there's too much of the New Testament that doesn't make sense if you say that they didn't have the assumption that salvation is something that you could lose. Uh, so again, without uh, going into uh, the theology of it, I'm just going to plant my flag and say that that is one of the things that I believe in. So when you do attain, you know, the 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 salvation that you have, you also have to protect it. You have to keep it. You have to remain faithful. Uh, so, you know, I can have a million dollars. Uh, you can give me a briefcase with a million dollars and I can lose it. But you gave it to me as a free gift. Yeah, but I, I could lose it. <laughs> I could squander it. Uh, I can set it on fire. Um, and I the same thing, I, I think the Bible actually speaks in those types of terms with uh, salvation. So I think that these orthodoxy, I would actually agree uh, now with uh, Mac, uh, since we're talking about trying to have some view of Christian orthodoxy. And the agreement that I will have with Mac is the Jesus exclusivity. Now, this is one thing that I don't like about Christianity. Uh, and I think that better forms of Christianity get rid of the exclusivity clause. Uh, I think those are better Christianities, better religions, better humanities. But I think that the if if there is any kind of orthodox Christianity, you know, original intent, I think it does include uh, a Jesus belief that he is God and that he's the way and no one else is. Uh, and if you try to reach God, even if it's, even if it's Yahweh, you know, it's not Allah, it's not Zeno, it's not, you know, whatever, it's Yahweh. You're trying to, you believe in Yahweh and you love Yahweh and you want to get to Yahweh and you want to skip Jesus, you can never get to Yahweh. Uh, that's, I, I think... I think the New Testament um, is pretty clear on that. And then uh, I'll do one more. Uh, this one may be the most controversial. Um, if we say that Paul was a genuine apostle, messenger of God, I do not think he was. Uh, but I think the literature wants us to think that. And so uh, let's go with it. If that is the case, and you have... Uh, doctrines that are opposed to anything that Paul taught, whether you think it's central to Christianity or not, you are accursed and you are not a Christian. This you get from Paul. <laughs> this, is, this is what Paul says about Paul. And so if you're a Pauline Christian, then Paul is your Pope. Uh, and, and so it has to be... Uh, you don't get a chance to disagree with Paul and also be a Christian. I, th I think that's just the case. And so uh, what Paul says about women preachers, for instance, if you think that Paul gives a message about that and that message is clear, 
that is orthodoxy. If, uh, you know, whatever Paul says about homosexuality, Jesus doesn't say anything about homosexuality, not a single word, but Paul does. And if you're a Pauline Christian, what Paul says about homosexuality goes. And if you reject that, you reject Christianity. Um, so these are some of the elements uh, that I think are necessary, um, non-negotiable feats, uh, acts, uh, doctrines of Christianity. I'm going to uh, bring you in here, Mac. Uh, you want to grill me on uh, anything in specific, uh, particularly that I've said so far? In specific, my goodness, uh, it's it's a whole list. Um, yeah, and, and just so you like guys know, every... I did I did not give Mac any any of this up front. So <laughs> yeah, I'm hearing this for the first time, and I feel like every single point could be its own series. Uh, but the thing that I'm noticing the most is that, like, obviously we're not going to be able to talk about all of these things today. But every point that you bring up is pretty much like something that I vehemently disagree with because for instance you say um, things like okay baptism is required um, and then you say uh, faith and works faith is a work because it's volitional and the gospels don't agree and Christianity develops like it changes between the time of Christ and the time of Paul and then it becomes this whole different thing but the thing I want to like zoom in on uh, was the the understanding of what the gospel is because i strongly believe that if someone understands what the gospel is then they even if they're not a christian they can say okay this is what the gospel is then they can understand how the rest of it sorts of folds in okay. together so let, let, let me have 30 seconds to interrupt you because okay. you're right and i and i meant to so this uh the um or the, the atonement uh, stuff. You're right. That that is one of the things I meant to mention. I just didn't realize that I didn't. Uh, so I can be really quick. Uh, I believe that the only view of atonement that is biblical is substitutionary atonement, uh, because you are a sinner with original sin. It it has nothing to do with whether you actually commit a sin. If you live a perfect life, you're still a sinner. Uh, because I think that original sin, through Adam we die. Uh, so y you don't get away from original sin. So in that way, works has nothing to do with it. Uh, you can you can be perfect and you're still a sinner. Um, and the only way to uh, get yourself out from under that curse of sin, because it's a curse, not an act. It can also be an act, but you're under a curse. So get out from that curse of sin. The only way to do that is through the work of Jesus on the cross. God had to have Jesus die because uh, it had to be an ultimate sacrifice. Uh, and you have to tie into that sacrifice uh, by faith through the various activities that faith requires. But that's substitutionary atonement. If you deny substitutionary atonement, then I think that you deny a fundamental aspect of Christianity, because you're denying that you have sins that need to be atoned for in a substitutionary way. Right, right. Um, usually when, when I, I talk to people who left the faith, uh, I would say most of the time when I ask them, okay, what is Christianity? And I'm glad we're having this conversation because this helps paint a better picture. It's like when, when you go to a vending machine and you know you have like a like a one <laughs> that's crumpled up and then you put in the one into the vending machine and then it goes in and then it processes and then it spits it back out. And then so you have to take the thing again, you have to like strain it out, like make sure it's flat and everything, and then you put it back in again and then and then it comes out again and then finally you 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 know you just okay, I'm gonna try and use a five instead. And the point of this analogy is to show that I can understand why someone would apostatize given what you've said. So given that you've said that Christianity is about, you know, like, like, because, because faith is volitional, then that means that, you know, I, I kind of like, I owe God in a sense where I have to work out my salvation in the sense of I have to earn my keep. So, so to speak, I have to 
do these things so that God can accept me. And the thing is, when that's when that's what you understand Christianity to mean, then it's going to just become another religion. It's going to become another yoke. It's going to become another burden. So if you make faith a work, if you make your good deeds part of how you get a right standing with God. So uh, hypothetically, because you don't believe this, but you're standing before God and he asks you, why should I let you into heaven? And you say, you know, it's because I, I was really nice to my neighbor. I, I was nice to my wife. I never did this. I did all these good things. Uh, and also I believed in Jesus. So when you say, I believe in Jesus, plus I did all these other things, what you're saying is that what Christ did was not sufficient enough and you kind of have to supplement it. And so where, where the big uh, disconnect happens is when people who are always trying to supplement their Christianity and they believe that they're actually, uh, they're, they're, they're trying, I'm like, you know, I'm, I'm trying really hard here to, 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 to be saved. That's why I'm, I'm doing evangelism 24 seven if I can. The, the problem with that is that at some point you are going to burn out. And the reason you're going to burn out is because you're not strong. You're not, you're not omnipotent. You're, you're a human being at the end of the day. And when you're trying to earn your salvation, there's a sense in which you don't understand Christian salvation. So Jesus said, uh, the person the, the when the two people are in the temple praying, you have the, the, the Pharisee and the tax collector, the tax collector is thanking God. He's saying, I thank God I am not like this other person. I do this, I do this, I fast, I, I'm i generous. And the tax collector says, have mercy on me, a sinner. And the person who goes home justified, Jesus says, is the one who confesses, who says they have nothing to bring to God. The other person was bringing things to God. The other, uh, the, 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 the tax collector was not. And so if you can understand that, if you can see that about yourself, if you can internalize that, then Christianity ceases to be about keeping the rules. Because people always say, you know, like the Old Testament has lots of commands. The New Testament, it's a bit lax, but that's not true at all. There's about 1,600 imperatives in the New Testament where a Christian should do this. It says you should do this because, and if if you take the list of you should do this in the new testament and you try and keep it every day you're not going to be able to do it you, you you'll you'll crumble and fall if you try and keep the the sermon on the mount you can't do it for even a day because it's so demanding and so what the gospel is which is so important for anyone who's like what is christianity what the gospel says is that a person is is saved by sheer grace hundred percent the grace of God uh, and that grace comes with it comes with faith and it comes with repentance and so when God transforms your life he gives you the gospel he gives you his word and the gospel has promises it says if you believe in Jesus then this is what's gonna happen and what's gonna happen is that God is going to give you a new nature that stops uh, depending on yourself for salvation depending on yourself for salvation meaning you're looking inwardly or you're looking at your performance. What, what being saved, what being a Christian is about is always looking to Christ for salvation. It's not about looking to your works, not looking to how, how, how obedient have I been uh, this week. And this, this doesn't mean that those things are not important. They are important because that's how you confirm that you are really saved. But those are not the foundation. Those are not the basis. Like, like I said last week, and I'm about to wrap up here, uh, when to, when you build a house, you have to start with the foundation. And when you start with the faulty foundation, it doesn't matter how, <laughs> doesn't matter how good the house looks on the outside. You can have the most beautiful looking house with the best walls, but if the foundation is faulty, then the house is going to crumble in of, in and of itself. And what tends to happen is, uh, people go to church. Uh, and, and they are like, okay, well, I'm part of this community now, you know, my, I have, I've left behind some bad habits. So I'm the one who's doing this. Wow. I'm really saved. But someone who says that in a, in a very real way has not understood that it's God who's doing the work, like salvation comes from the Lord. And the biggest challenge 
is to convince someone who thinks like that 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 that's not what Christ teaches in the Bible. That's not what the apostles teach. Salvation ultimately comes from God. And the final final thing I'm going to say uh, has to do with like, okay, what about orthodox beliefs? You know, like like you know, like I have all these beliefs about you know how you can lose your salvation and and all these other things and da 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 da. What what the Bible does is that it gives you stories where you, you're supposed to like because because humans understand stories better than they do uh, abstract concepts. So you're right when you say that. Uh, it's not meant to be like a, it's like when, when Paul was writing his letters, he wasn't like writing a systematic theology textbook. But the thing is this, when, when you look at the story of the Exodus from Egypt, where you have the Israelites in bondage in, in, in slavery, and if you are, if you were to interview one of these Israelites and ask them, okay, okay, tell, tell me, tell me your story. You, you run into them, tell me your story. What's, what's going on with you. They'll be able to tell you that, okay, I was under a sentence of death in a foreign land. Um, I took shelter under the blood of the lamb. Uh, and then God rescued me by sheer grace. I didn't have to do anything. The Red Sea parted. He, he got us through. Uh, his presence is in our midst. And he gave us his law so we can be a community. And now we're headed to the promised land. And you realize that a Christian would be able to say those same exact things. They'll be able to say they took shelter in the blood of the lamb. They were in a foreign land under the sentence of death. God rescued them. God rescued them by sheer grace. And then he gave them the law. So the Israelites didn't get the law while they were still in Egypt. God had to take them out. He had to save them first. And the Israelites were like them, them putting the blood on the door post, on the door. That wasn't them earning. Like it wasn't like, it was just something that God told them to do and God rescued them and then he gave them his law. And so the same way for a Christian, they're saved by God's grace and then God gives them the law. It's not God gives them the law so that they can become saved. It's that they're saved by grace first and then they come out of the land. And the same thing that an Israelite would say is the same thing a Christian would say. And so that's the biggest takeaway I'm, I'm, I'm from, from listening to you. Uh, when you're saying, you know, like you have to do this in order to become a Christian. No, grace has to invade your life and you have to see that God is the one who who causes salvation from beginning all the way to the end. And when you understand that, there's uh, there's a joy and a peace that comes with it that cannot come from trying to be a moral person. Being a moral person comes automatically because God is the one working in you. Okay. Um, obviously, there there are many series of discussions. You're right that we get <laughs> that we get out with those. Uh, we're not going to have those today, but um, uh, I encourage people, skeptics and seekers. Squarespace. dot com. Log in your discuss account. Discuss away. Um, let's move to the second part, which is um, a very difficult question, uh, and. I recognize it's a difficult question. I don't think it's unfair, but I do recognize it's difficult and possibly maybe impossible to answer. Uh, which is how is a person supposed to know when they are seeing and hearing real Christianity versus some counterfeit? Uh, during the run up to this, I did mention to Mac that I would be asking this, and I also mentioned that I think the internet has been unkind to Christianity, uh, not unfairly. But, but again, it, it has definitely been unkind in, in the way that it, it gives people a voice. You know, if you got a microphone and, and if you got a smartphone, you got a microphone. Uh, if you got an uh, internet connection, if you can hear this, you've got an internet connection, <clears throat> then you can say anything. And people who would not be allowed in their churches to go anywhere near a microphone or a classroom of people to teach now suddenly become internet teachers. And I don't think Christians think about that. And I think that you should think about that. You should absolutely think about that. In fact, I believe if I were a Christian today, my advice would be to Christians at a congregation, do not 
go on the internet and start spouting Christianity. We, we will give you training classes. We'll give you certifications, but do not do it. Uh, because the moment that you do it, you become an, a teacher, you become an authority. You are setting yourself up to be that you are defining Christianity and you are putting yourself in a position to mislead people and possibly lead people into a false Christianity that uh, leads them to maybe try Christianity and walk away from it and lose their souls. You did that. You did that because you couldn't stay off the fucking internet, you fool. That's what you did. That was your arrogance that did that. Uh, no one told you to do that. You didn't have to do that. And, and you knew that you wouldn't be allowed to do that if there was somebody in authority, oh, say like an elder, who who would have authorized or not authorized you to do it. You knew they wouldn't let you do it because we won't let you do it here. So sit down and shut up would be my advice to most Christians on the internet. That is not advice that they take. And so Christianity is harmed in any number of ways, including the way of making it super difficult for anyone to know the difference between real Christianity and fake Christianity. Now, also, as I mentioned to Mac, it was super diff difficult in the first place. I think it was super difficult in the first century, uh, frankly. It's super difficult uh, before the internet, because if you can just stand on a street corner and say things, develop a following, start a congregation, you've got enough money, you've got enough charisma, uh, you know, enough marketing savvy you can start a church and now you're Joel fucking Osteen. Are you an authority on Christianity? Well, yes, for millions of people. But are you really? Um, and so I think that Christianity has a problem of being recognized as Christianity and distinguished from counterfeits. And before I ask any uh pointed questions, I would just ask Matt uh, if you would mind commenting uh, on that. Where do, where, do you, where do you see it? Do you, do you see the problem the same way as I do, differently? Is it not a problem? Well, it's a, it's a double-edged sword, right? Uh, as most things are, like the internet has been revolutionary. Uh, I remember a time in my life when there was no internet. And now there's internet. Now I can talk to people who are across the other side of the world. It's great. But also there's a downside to it. Everything has positive and everything has negatives. Now, the negative, um, I don't know. In the final analysis, um, I can't, like I, like, I agree with you. Yeah, harm has been caused. False doctrine has been put out there. But when I look at the other side of the coin, uh, there's good doctrine has gone out there and people have been helped. And so addressing the negative stuff. Yes, you're right. Uh, it's unfortunate. It's an unfortunate uh, uh, feature of our time that anyone with an Internet connection can gather up a following and become an authority, a spiritual authority even. And they don't have um, the credentials for it, or they don't have the temperament for it, or they don't have the training for it. And so what, what, what's happened is just too many unfortunate things have happened. And I don't think the solution is to tell people to shut up or to say, okay, if you're a Christian, just stay off the internet. I think there's a more nuanced way of going about it, which involves, you know, the, it, it's it has to be at the local ch church level but the thing that that is going on today is that but it's coming back a little bit is that people never well i shouldn't say never but people sort of downplayed the importance of being in a local church community so mm -hmm. new testament christianity has people in church communities uh what you have today are people like some people who perhaps are really saved who say you know like i went to a church once and people were really mean to me so i'm i don't want to go to church i'm i'm just gonna do my own thing over here and the disadvantage to that is that they're cutting themselves off from other people from sound doctrine 
and they might be like, okay, I'm going to start a YouTube channel and I'm going to tell people uh, what I read, you know, like, and usually the, the sort of uh, folks that do this, um, you'll find them with, with a vested interest in, in, in not, not the main specific things that have to do with God and salvation and um, how does a person get right with God. The, the, the main focus uh, for some of these folks are the things like in Revelation, uh, cryptic things that have to do with eschatology. And they're teaching on these things like like they have figured it out. You know, like in 2000 years of Christianity, no one saw what they're now seeing for the first time. You know, like in 2020, it was like, OK, Mark of the Beast is the COVID vaccine. You know, people are going around saying stuff like this and stuff like that does harm the witness. but if you're a, if you're a sensible person if you're a reasonable person like you should be able to see right through this you should be able to see when someone is saying stuff and it's not coming from a well grounded well researched uh place uh so i i know lots of christians that i disagree with but they're smart and 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 they they're grounded in how they present the material they they know uh, their their stuff and 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 the issue that happens today is that sensationalism in the form of like a guy's just going okay I'm gonna get a camera crew and um I'm gonna go out in the streets I'm gonna start uh I'm not gonna it's not even it's not even evangelism he's just gonna start bothering people um, I get these kinds of videos on my feed where a guy's just going around and he's like just you know just he's just <laughs> He's being a Pharisee towards people. He's saying, "Okay, you're a sinner," and when you, when you, when that's your leading, uh, I mean, yeah, sure. But like, if that's how you lead with with your conversation, you're definitely gonna get some retaliation. And so the big thing again, this is I, this is not just Christianity. Christianity's problem. This is uh, this is our culture's problem where people are are concerned with their social image on the internet, and so. Yeah, you're right, but also you're not fully there. I don't think the solution is to say, okay, now no more internet for you, but it, it, it's to, to exercise uh, your discernment, to exercise how well you are at perceiving who you're listening to. Can you listen to someone that you disagree with and 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 pick up the good stuff and, and leave out the bad stuff? Can you do right. that? So, so yeah. that, that leads us directly into the topic. Because I, I just fundamentally disagree um, when you're talking about the average person who doesn't know, you know, whatever proper Christianity is. Uh, right. They don't have an intuition on that. You can't trust. You can't say your human intuition is faulty, you know, because you know you're it's been destroyed by sin or whatever, and yet you should use your human intuition to determine which preacher is telling the truth. I don't think human intuition gets you there. Uh, and I don't, I don't think there's any version of discernment that can do it. And so here's an example. This, you're not going to agree with this, uh, obviously, and this might even trigger some, <laughs> some people in the audience, but uh, I can't step away from, uh, from this example. So if we look at uh, voodoo, uh, ancient and modern forms of voodoo, you know, where people are saying incomprehensible things and doing uh, unspeakable things with chicken entrails. Y you just look at that intuitively and say, oh, that's batshit crazy. That there is, there is no part of the vast majority of humans who would look at that and say, no, that looks sane. Let me, let me dig into that some more. Uh, and then let's, let's go back in time. If you just go zoom back past Christianity, you see something very similar happening, except it's not chicken entrails. It's let's, let's butcher larger animals, uh, bulls and goats, sheep, um, uh, and let's put them on an altar and, you know, make, uh, blood sacrifices to a God that's just standard Judaism. 
it, it, it is no more sane on the face of it than voodoo. But, but Judaism had a more successful run. <laughs> so now if we come back toward the middle and we get to Christianity, which is syncretized against uh, Judaism, you have uh, you know, a situation where the Jews really can't make these sacrifices anymore. There's no temple and all that. Um, well, so we'll end the sacrificial system, but how will we end it? By one effective human sacrifice. All right, so you got on the far, uh, one far end, chicken entrails. On another far end, uh, large animals, uh, on altars. And then in the middle, one human sacrifice. Not a single one of them looks more sane than the other. The only thing that makes the Jewish and Christian story more sane is because of popularity. It but if you step if you're able to step out of that and see it the way a secular, a pure secularist would see it. The chicken entrails is the lesser of all of the evils. I'd, I'd rather butcher chickens than goats. And I don't want anything to do with a human sacrifice. And then Christian doubles down by saying, oh, you on a weekly basis, you must eat the flesh of this person and drink their blood, which the largest Christian denomination in the world believes is literal. So there's, there's, you cannot, I think, make an appeal to intuition of, of what seems to, you know, in discernment and Christianity come out on top. All right. Um, I just want to address something again, even for the, for the listeners, like this, this interaction is a perfect example where, Okay, you're making claims and I'm making claims. And so the person who's listening and, and they're like, I don't know who's telling the truth. Like my request, my earnest desire is for them to go and look it up for themselves. So um, uh, there's a chronology error in, in some of the things you said. It just uh, it doesn't jive with me because um, and I'll, and I'll, I'll address the sacrifice thing in a bit. But when you say Christianity is is uh christianity is judaism it's like a synchronized judaism and you say you know it's because um the temple was missing and so they had to find a new way a new religion well i would say there's an error there because uh christianity predates the the destruction of the jewish temple the jewish temple was destroyed in 70 a.d and uh if you read the gospels and even if you read uh, josephus you'll find that christianity uh, was not seen as part of Judaism. Uh, it was seen as its own thing. So in the Gospels, you have people who believed in Jesus being put out of the synagogue. They were told, you are not Christians. Uh, you're not Jews anymore. You're you're traitors. And they were put out of the synagogues. And then uh, in the 60s uh, in Rome, you have uh, Nero being able to differentiate between uh, Jews and Christians. It's not like Christians were like this uh, denomination of Judaism. So on that, it's not minor, but it's, it's kind of major. On that major point like alone, you, if, if, if you see it that way, then everything else is going to go off kilter. Can I have a 60-second rebuttal then? Since you consider, if sure. you didn't consider it re important, I wouldn't rebut. <laughs> okay, you can. But okay, 60 seconds, sure. Okay, you can you can stop me if I go along. Uh, yes, uh, I agree with all of that, but I would say that most of the Bible, certainly all of the Gospels, were written after seventy. Uh, and I would also say that the time before seventy, it was turbulent times in which the Jews were not really in control of their temple or their destiny, and for a long time, for possibly centuries. Jews were uh, recognizing the untenableness of this sacrificial system. Uh, and in fact, for many Jews who are wandering in uh, the diaspora, they didn't have a temple at all. And so they, they, there had always been this strain of Judaism that had to find a way to do Judaism without the signs of Judaism. Um, I just think historically, like what you said, isn't uh, feasible because, again, uh, 
during Passover, you had Jews from the diaspora coming to Jerusalem to take part in the sacrificial system that was going on there. And and it wasn't like they saw their religion as less than because they had synagogues. It was just that Jerusalem was the centralized place of worship because that's where the temple was. And that's where they believed God's presence was. And so they would they would they would do what did, what did they do when the temple was destroyed? Well, that's that comes like a whole generation after Christianity. Uh, no, no, no. In the Old Testament, because we're by the time you're in Christianity, you're oh, right. in the temple too. So, what did they do when the uh, temple was destroyed? When they were out in Babylon, they were in exile, right? And then they came back, and what did they do? They rebuilt the second temple. But in the meantime, they didn't have a temple, and they. This is why I said it was it started right. centuries back. They had to figure out a way to be Jews without the marks of Judaism. Right. But then when they came back to the land, they rebuilt the temple, the second temple. That's why there's a second temple Judaism. And the, the difference between second temple Judaism and first temple Judaism is that in second temple Judaism, you had the introduction of synagogues where people like were more uh, conscious of, of, of learning what the law of Moses said. They were very... They're very in tune with that, as opposed to before, where they were very lax. Like they had all these priests who were like apostate priests, and the kings were just, just running r rampant. When they come back from exile, there's none of that happening. So they're a lot more uh, strict with how they they practice uh, Judaism. But by the time of Jesus, uh... by the time of Jesus, the same thing is going on, and the the, the only difference is that instead of there being there's there's Romans now in the land. Right, there's a Roman Empire. Well, right, it's not Romans in the land; it's the Roman land, and you are under the rule of Romans. And one could say that the Herods, kings, and the uh, priests, maybe even the high priests, were extremely corrupt. And most Jews, uh, certainly many, wouldn't have been able to make the trek uh, to Jerusalem once a year. And so, Jerusalem Judaism had already transformed into something that would have been very different from, say, Moses' um, right. uh, Judaism. Of course. So, and, 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 the, and the issue, though, is that it was still Judaism. But when you say Christianity is Judaism light, I think you're missing, a like, historically, that's simply not true because Christians were being put out of synagogues. They weren't allowed to be. So it wasn't even like it was like, OK, you guys are a different denomination or something. It's not like they were like uh, the Pharisees and Sadducees. They were different things. That's why they recognized okay, they were these considered are not sects of the Jews. In fact, I think that very term sect of the Jews uh, might be in the Gospels. But uh, um, no, th but they not. were but they <laughs> were but it they really were isn't. considered simply it may not be I. Uh, but they they were considered a Jewish sect, and I'm pretty sure that I can back that up pretty strongly. If but look, you can I, back I don't it up I don't mean to, yeah. I, I don't mean to turn this into that debate. I just yeah. wanted to uh, to make the case for it. So this is not new. I I I think my case is much stronger. I I note your objection, but I have I have already. Uh, incorporated your uh, objection into my longer work on this. So and, it's... and I just, I just, again, I, I disagree with you because I don't think it's historically accurate. It's not no based problem. on based on stuff we read, even from secular we, sources. We can, like, we can have that debate some other time. You don't, you, you don't have to. I'm not. Yeah, yeah. I'm just. Yeah. This is a this is a pass through sort of just. And, and it's maybe it's helpful for someone out there, and it's like, okay, okay, who's telling the truth? <laughs> Because I think it's it's useful for someone to have the right chronology. Because if you're thinking Christianity is just uh, how Jews were, like Paul decided, you know, our religion is dying off. You know, let's come up with something else. If that's what you're working off of, then you've already gone off the reservation. You're all the way out there. And I just want to bring you back in and say, okay, historically, that's not what happened. Okay, but you saying that doesn't help the person who's listening know that. So there, right. there is, saying, in fact, scholarship that you can... Uh, right. That you can go to, but you're going to have to go to some of that scholarship. You're you're not going to know the answer just by listening to Mac and I debate. Yeah. yeah. Um. So, um. Go read. I, uh, I, you know, whatever whatever Mac is saying, I know that there is a certainly a strong contingent of Christians who believe that, but there are also a strong contingent who agree with what I'm saying. As Never well. met them. I don't think they are. 
I think you, I think uh, you haven't I've met a lot of people. No, I have met. I feel like <laughs> I have met more. I, I talked to more uh, along the spectrum uh, than you do. And and the thing is this. Um, I know there's a whole Jesus only movement where people say, okay, it's only the red letters, right? That's what you titled your book, um, where it's like, okay, we discard everything else in the in the Bible except for the words that are in red. And that movement itself is its own other thing. But my point is this, just again, this is an appeal to the audience because they're the ones who are listening in. They, they, they listen in some of them every week. I don't uh, demand that anyone take my word. You're wasting time. Right. Don't take my <laughs> so. word for it either. Go be a good Berean, as we say. Uh, go read up on, on Josephus. Read up on Nero. Read up on the, the history of the early church and see how Christians were viewed as different than Jews. They weren't even seen as the same because because Christians in like it wasn't just the Jew it was Gentiles it was Romans it was Greeks it was Scythians it was all kinds of nationalities and they were all worshiping together and that's what caused people to raise their eyebrows and say how is how does this religion work uh, because right. in the ancient you're, world you're you're, um, you're you're still defending territory that is it, it yeah. is not going to move your case forward I okay. I get right. that you think that my time long line is wrong and people get that I think that you're wrong about me being wrong so what what else is in your case all right so I'm not necessarily trying to convince you right now but I'm just saying uh for the sake of the audience the the, the two people who listen to me and, and be like oh he made a good point uh for the sake of those people uh, I would just say research it don't take our word for it. Uh, look it up for yourself and see, okay, was Christianity seen as a sect of Judaism or was it seen as a separate thing? Okay, now second thing about the sacrifice thing. Um, yeah, I, I hear this all the time. I The, the first time I heard this uh, complaint was from uh, Matt Delahunty many, many years ago. And he was like saying, okay, you're God... He likes the smell of barbecue, um, and so that's why he was asking people to make sacrifices uh, to him because he loves meat and, and death and all these things. But the, the thing is that as modern people, because obviously we don't see these things and they're not prevalent to us and we're in a different culture and all these other things, we automatically presume or uh, infer our own we, we pretty much juxtapose our views onto something. So if we see someone, is it like, why would they do that? Why would someone, you know, kill an animal um, and sacrifice it? But the symbolism behind it, uh, behind the sacrifices, was that in order for, for a person, in order for God to pardon a person, the symbolism was that their sin was still liable for punishment. Uh, it's just that it's just that it was transferred to another party. Now, atheists are like, okay, well, that's so scandalous. And it's like, of course it's scandalous. Um, as Paul says, the gospel is foolishness uh, to, to those who are not uh, believing. But the, 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 the main point was in that God desired animals, like he owns the animals. The point was that when sin happens, uh, Creation is messed up, not just the person who is uh, sinning. So if I sin against you, I I have the potential, I have the power to mess up uh, not only just you, but other people and even the rest of the environment around me. And so when someone brought a sacrifice, inadvertently they were saying, okay, I have sinned and I need I need a substitute. I need I need uh help i need uh grace and so the, the 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 sacrifice was kind of a symbol of that happening so instead of the person getting punished it fell on the poor animal and and what the author of hebrews says was that all these things were not to take away sin so the blood of bulls and goats cannot take away sin and that they were pointing to a bigger reality where you have the son of god Christ Jesus coming down and and actually living 
uh, the life that we ought to live, but we don't. And and because God has to punish every sin, he can't just overlook the sin. What the Christian message says is this. Every sin is going to be punished, and it's either punished in hell for eternity, or it was punished on the cross. So for those who trust in Jesus, all their sins have been paid for on the cross. For those who don't, then they haven't been paid for. And so the call is to see, okay, a righteous God is not going to overlook my sin. So finally, if I were to come to your house and I were to break something, let's say break up a special uh, vase that you have in your house, and you were to say, you know what? Don't worry about it. You know, it's, it's okay. It's nothing. But let's say you were to loan me your car and I was to crash your car. Then either way, you still have to pay. Like with, with, the, with the, the vase that I broke, you know, you, you still, you could say, well, I can replace it. It's no big deal. I, I can pay for it. So I go free and you still have to pay for it somehow. The more, uh, the higher the higher the offense gets in terms of me breaking your car or causing an accident uh the more you have to pay so what christianity teaches is that on the cross god paid the ultimate price for our failures for our sins and so that's what's going on there it's not a desire to give blood to god it's it's god showing that even though we have failed he paid the price of our failures with his own life that's it that's that's what christianity is that i fail but god doesn't fail and he gave his life so that i can go free it's not that i'm earning my freedom it's that he's the one setting me free Okay. Um, I hope that makes sense to someone. N well, it doesn't make sense to me, but I, <clears throat> it, the effort makes sense. Oh, wait a minute. Hello. Sorry, I, I had muted myself. That uh, yeah. it doesn't make sense to me. Okay. Um, it might That's make sense okay. to someone. I it make the effort that you're making makes sense, but you have to understand what I hear and what I think millions of people around the world uh, hear, which is. Right, you justifying a human sacrifice. See, when well, when we when we well, let me let me get this out. When we sure, when sure, we sure. see um, a a practitioner of voodoo doing something freaky with chicken entrails, we don't stop to listen to them to hear their well reasoned explanation for why they're doing it. Maybe more people would do voodoo if they did if they stopped to listen. Because I'm pretty sure that there are some practitioners who are well-spoken and who can really give a good, winsome uh, explanation of why they do it. But our instinct is correct. When you see someone doing something for you with uh, entrails, walk away. <clears throat> Would, I, right, don't, I, don't, right. I don't care. I don't care what they're, they're, they're doing. Uh, same thing with sacrificing large animals in a temple. Okay, you see a temple, okay, uh, you see an altar, you should be worried. You see an animal break out in sweats, now there's a priest uh, now butchering an animal uh, to sacrifice their God. Uh, we That's we don't listen, we don't, hang on, we don't listen to that sermon, we walk away. And so in the same, uh, by the same token, when we see that God puts someone, a human being, on a cross, it doesn't matter that you say he's also God, he's also 100% human, he's a human being, uh, on a torture device to die and bleed for his sacrifice as opposed to a large animal, uh, I think that we should treat it in the same way we treat the chicken entrails. I don't care what your winsome explanation is, I have stopped listening uh, you lost me at human sacrifice. So again, yeah, you, so the, the biggest issue is that you say, I stopped listening. And, and the thing is, it's you're, you're, you're making it so that you're, 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 you, ha you can't make this argument without invoking the, the voodoo person who does what they do for different reasons. So they are doing it 
for completely different reasons. And for me, like I just as a well, I'll, the I'll, person doesn't like, know that if they don't listen well, uh, th thoroughly to the voodoo person, you, you wouldn't encourage them to do that. Well, uh, well and I, I would, I'm just saying, when you see chicken you entrails, that. walk away, and when you see a human sacrifice, run away. It's worse than the chicken entrails. Yeah, there, can and I so, respond to that? Well, uh, and you might re respond winsomely. I'm just, I'm just saying why there is no response that you can give that makes it more sane. And your appeal was for people to use their common sense and intuition to know when someone is speaking falsely about Christianity. And I just wanted to make the point that once they understand this aspect of Christianity, th it goes against all human reason. Uh, and so you have to appeal to something else besides human reason if you want people to know what true Christianity is versus false. No, no I, so there's a lot of things to, to pick apart there. Uh, the first has to do with, um, you saying like okay it's the same thing as voodoo which it isn't but you're saying okay the person should do this well when you say you should do can i um when you're saying you well yeah should, you said i said it was the same thing and i was just going to say no i think it's worse and right that's, that's right what I said. It, 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 you said it's worse but you're you you have to start with that comparison because it's um it's that fallacy i don't know the one where you make something look uh, guilty by association, right? It's like saying, like, if, if you wear, Hitler wore this thing, um, if you wear it, then you're also like, it, it, it's one, it's it's a guilt by association fallacy. Um, no, it's not. Bit. No, wait, I'm wait, sorry. Hold, hang on, hang no, on, sorry. hang on. But that's not true. That's false. It's guilt by what you say you believe. This is not association. No, this no, is you that, believe in a human sacrifice. That I we're don't, done. Though, but, but here's, here's me trying to clarify. So the thing is this. When, when someone, okay, you, you, you're interested in, okay, what do you believe? And then you, you've you already tuned them out. You're like, okay, you, you believe in human sacrifice. No human reason should be, uh, should allow that. So the thing is, this is one of those cultural moments thing, moments things. Um, so in the past, when people made uh, an agreement, they didn't have paper to sign. All right, if you're going to pay me this amount, um, much amount of money. They didn't have pen and paper, so what they did is that they would kill an animal and separate it in half, and then one person would walk across, and then the person who was making the the deal or the covenant or the contract would say, if I don't pay you, uh, may what happen to this animal happen to me, and there were witnesses there. So that's how people did it in the past. Today, you, you write your name, sign your initials on a piece of paper. So what's the point? Of Kind of bringing uh, it's that when you when you say oh there's no there's no way for human reason to to accept this you're using like you're using your culture your cultural moment today in this time that you live in to make an assessment about other human beings and you're saying my culture is superior to your culture whatever okay fine but you can't say it's not based on human reason that there it, it is based on human reason second thing Christ's death on the cross is not human sacrifice in the way that you describe it. And the way, the reason you describe it that way, again, goes back to what I said about seeing salvation as grace, because you don't see it as being fully grace. You see it as you having to contribute something to it. Because you see it as that, then by definition, you're going to look at Christ's death and and voluntary giving of his life. It wasn't the it wasn't divine child abuse. You are going to see it as nonsensical. You're going to see it as stupid. You're going to see it as was like, it a sacrifice or not? It is, but it's not in not in the way that you describe okay. it. Okay. Well, okay, but it was a sacrifice. Was Jesus human or not? It was not human the way you and I are humans. W really? That's he's not not that's, he was fully God and fully man. So that, what I mean is that he did not have a sin nature. So he's not a human. Let me being. let me let me ask you this: If right a virgin here. in the village volunteered to sacrifice herself for the villagers, would that make the human sacrifice less human sacrifice? It's not the same thing, but you're trying to make it the same thing. That's why I'm disagreeing with you because you're bringing in all these analogies that are not. Even well, what's what's different? What's the difference between uh, what you're saying about Jesus and what I just said about the virgin volunteering to be sacrificed? Okay, what what is she sacrificing herself for? I, 
no idea. No idea why well, people well, for, well, so right. that the village can be saved. Why ever they that's sacrificed well, virgins? That, that's not something that 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 would make sense because okay. that's not something that she can do. Whereas Christ okay. before, like here, here's something that that usually gets missed by skeptics and atheists is that they say, well, well, <laughs> Jesus is just a, is a product of circumstance, like that, that it, as if the Gospels don't hammer this point that Jesus himself said that the reason he came was to do this thing, this one thing. Now, right, he volunteered. What want, right, and, and but the way you present it is that it's like this divine child abuse. That, you no, know, I didn't that, present it that way at all. I said it was a human sacrifice. Right. But I didn't, but I didn't, I didn't say abuse, anything right? about, uh, I didn't say anything about divine child abuse. I but said you know, it was a human sacrifice. But you believe it's, it's hey, child. Can it's we, can we stick with what I said? Right. And, and I'm trying. I but, said it was human sacrifice and you haven't said anything that goes against that. The wait. only thing that you can say is it was an effective human sacrifice. Great. But it's okay. still a human sacrifice. I, I don't call it a human sacrifice. The I know Bible, you don't call yeah, it that, right, but right, maybe you Bible should. No, I shouldn't because that's not how it's. I like you're you're trying. Here's the thing, you're trying to get me to accept what you how you see things based on on a very transcendent okay. view. Hold I, on, I'm gonna sh I'm gonna shut up. Just, just tell me tell me how you think it's not a human sacrifice. It, if if you can't convince me, convince the audience. I will not rebut whatever you say next. Well, you said okay. You said you're not going to convince me either way because the optics of it, the way it looks, it looks bad. So you should run away. Okay, great. Not going to convince you. But here's the thing that I'm appealing to the audience, right? Even if it's just one person, is that when you read about how the authors of the New Testament talk about Christ's death, don't even go by what I'm saying. Go read what they say. What they say is that it was all encompassing. Is that it wasn't just a death for, uh, for a, a propitia uh, pr propitiation. That it was much more. It was um. It was it was God displaying His love for sinners. Now, if you think it's silliness, it's foolishness, it's disgusting, it's crass, then the reason that you think that, and, and this is for you specifically, is because. You have a view of salvation that doesn't start with God. It starts with you. It starts with what? Well, what can I do? Oh, I have to be baptized. I have to have faith. I have to do this. And so when you do, when you have, when you start with yourself, and you come to the cross, then you're like, what is this? Uh, what is this necessary for again? And that's the danger that lots of people have. People go to church and they think falsely. Uh, mainly because some someone maybe they heard it somewhere, someone told them. They think that what the cross represents is just an additional thing to them trying to be a good person so they can add it onto it. Now, when you ask, how is it not a human sacrifice? Well, here's the thing. It's about uh, God's wrath against sin. And the, the biggest thing that I want to take out of people's minds if that's possible is when people say you know jesus only suffered for a weekend you know like he only gave up a weekend and and it wasn't it wasn't all that bad well he took on god's wrath and god's wrath is all that bad and he took that on behalf of sinners that's why it's so this this doctrine this this action is so precious to christians now when someone comes to it and says, oh, it's it's just human sacrifice, then they're only seeing the superficial level to it. They're not seeing the deeper implications that come with that. They, they are not seeing God's wrath against sin. They're not seeing God's love for sinners. They're only seeing the, the physical. They're seeing, oh, wow, look, a person suffering. Well, that's bad. And for Christians, it goes farther than that. It goes deeper than that because of the recognition that this person's suffering should not be suffering. I should be the one who's, who, who bears uh, the, the guilt for my sin. Now, if you say, well, that sounds all winsome and great, but it doesn't convince me, that's unfortunate. But the point is this, if you're someone who has an epistemology that cares about representing people accurately, then you shouldn't be content with saying, oh, it looks worse than voodoo because, you know, it looks weird 
Therefore, I don't want to, I don't want to subject myself to that. That's you imposing your cultural moment, which is the 24th century, and you're imposing it on other human beings. And you're saying they're stupid because they did things differently. And I don't think that's right. Like we were talking about it at the beginning of the show. You don't throw away humans. You also don't throw away those humans in the past who did things because it mattered to them and because it had a very strong symbol for them, a symbol that perhaps you don't have the same symbol. Like people wear wedding rings, right? Or be like, if, if 10 centuries from now, people are like, that's so stupid. They used to wear wedding rings on their finger to show they're married. That's That's a cultural moment thing. And so symbols are important for the people who are doing them. The sacrifices were a symbol. It's not that we're offering blood to God or like God needs blood. That's a caricature. That's a, that's a misrepresentation of Christian theology. All right. I think we're almost wrapping up now. Right. Uh, so uh, I'm going to actually ask that that just be your closing statement. Uh, and I'm no. not going to rebut it. Uh, that was <laughs> so, not my statement. I have a two-minute closing statement, but... Because uh, I was going to well, answer the question about outsiders. You're like, how is an outsider supposed to know? Okay. Un unfortunately, I think it would take us into a third hour, which which we don't have time for. But if you can okay. wrap up in two minutes, do that. All right. All right. Wrap up in two minutes. So, again, just the show in general has been talking about, okay, this is what I believe Christianity is. I think David brought up, I'm glad that he listed out the things that he thinks Orthodox Christianity are. I think he's wrong. I think he's wrong and that it's he's not wrong in the sense of like an experience. He's wrong in the sense that it's you're able to falsify everything that he said about salvation. For example, him saying uh, salvation is about uh, you and your works or that Paul and James were disagreeing with one another. These these are things that can be proven not to be the case because that's not what they're saying and that's not how the church understood it for centuries. Uh, and when it comes to someone, let's say a hypothetical person who's like, you know, there's so many forms of Christianity out there. Uh, which one do I go to? And listening to Ayan speaking, uh, she she was saying that she was going from church to church um, and she would find some churches where the, the person up there was was either talking about politics or they were just obsessed about Trump or this or that. And they had to leave the church. And I strongly believe that every human, every human being uh, who is, you know, like who's taking this seriously, would be able to to go to a congregation and be able to discern whether the person speaking there is speaking from their own authority or whether they're they're relying on God's word. So, uh, a church that has God at the center is the church that someone should be looking for. That's how an outsider knows. So you're saying, okay, I want to learn more about God. I want to learn more about Christ. You find a person, a speaker, a church community where God is at the center. It's not uh, social issues that are out there. It's not social justice. It's not these other things. It's God at the center. And when you do that, what you find is that all the other things fall into place. It's not merely uh, just... You know, like, okay, let's focus. If you if you hyper focus on on a minor thing, then the main things get lost on the shelf. So find a congregation where God is at the center. And if you're listening to a YouTuber or a, or a, or a personality on the Internet and they don't tell you about God, they don't tell you about salvation, they don't put their emphasis on these things, then that's a person that you should not listen to. That imperative is found in the Bible. Don't listen to false teachers who lead you astray, who make uh, tertiary issues the main issues. Find a person who speaks <laughs> about God's word and makes it the main focus, who puts Christ at the center. Okay. Uh, I'm going to reserve any closing remarks I have for the odd short that might happen over the next week or a month or whatever. Uh, so uh, as I look back on the first half of the season, uh, good season, good show. Uh, so I encourage uh, the commenters who log into skepticsandseekers.squarespace.com 
not only to log in your Discuss account and Discuss away, but uh, try to have equally good comments that um, that match the show. I think that we have set you up for uh, a couple of months of interesting conversation, to say the least. And uh, we'll see if we can't get Mac uh, set up here. And uh, I would encourage Mac, you, to step out of your comfort zone and not just do uh, solo shows, uh, because we can all talk by ourselves. Big deal. I suggest, uh, you find a skeptic, uh, to talk to bring on and challenge yourself. Wait, you're cutting um, a bit. I can't, I can't, I didn't catch the last bit that you said. I'm cutting out. Yeah. You're cutting out a little bit. Okay. So I, I encourage you to take the opportunity provided that we can get you set up to step out of your comfort zone and bring on some skeptics on the show. Uh, talk to them, have an exchange of uh, people you don't agree with. Um, doing a solo show is easy for those of us who talk a lot, especially those who talked for a living at one point. Piece of cake. Uh, talking to people, always way more interesting if you can manage it. So I encourage you to do that. Um, and uh, bring me uh, some shows as I... Uh, prepare for this season of hell uh bring me some shows that i will find interesting uh and uh give me a glimmer it's one of the things i hope give me a glimmer of what 4s looks like when i'm not on it because i don't want to do this for the rest of my life <laughs> so I, I i hope that we have a series of rotating hosts that go from here to eternity um so uh take take the opportunity uh, take a little ownership and do some things maybe that I wouldn't do. I, I uh, totally, I'm open to that. It's just that I don't know who to ask. <laughs> yeah, well, figure it out. It's part of it. Uh, so you're young. You got you got time to figure it out, work it out, make some mistakes, fuck it up. Uh, you're you're never gonna get anywhere until you until you get brave enough to do that. <laughs> so uh, I am giving you no restrictions whatsoever. I just want to see what you do with it. <laughs> so do something interesting with it. Um, whatever you do, make it interesting. I would rather you see uh, you make an interesting mistake than to be uninteresting and do everything perfectly. You've learned nothing and we've advanced not at all. So fuck it up. <laughs> just make it interesting. Uh, and with that, uh, we will talk to you next time. I'm not saying, okay, that there won't, I always end a season or even mid seasons with some kind of after show. It may happen in a couple of weeks. I don't know. Um, so the show's not over. Just the regular, normal 4S show that you can count on every week. That's, uh, that's over. And during this season, I am literally turning over uh, any formal, formal reins over to Mac. And I will just continue blabbering every now and then when I feel like it. So I just want you guys to understand uh, what's happening here. So um, yeah, let's let's all hang out for this. <laughs> I, I'm looking forward to it. I'm really looking forward to it. I need a break so much. <laughs> so <laughs> uh, with that said, uh, the break begins now. Peace.